Gospel is written in the 13th chapter of St. Matthew, beginning at the 31st verse. Jesus put before the crowds another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, someone took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of the seed, but when it is grown, it is the greatest of shrubs and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and make nets in its branches. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman looked, took and mixed in with three measures of flour until all it was leavened. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in the field which someone found and, and hid. Then in his joy he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. On finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and caught fish of every kind. When it was full, they drew it ashore, sat down, and put the good into the baskets, but threw out the bad. So will it be at the end of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the furnace of fire where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understood all of this? They answered, yes. And he said to them, therefore every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like the master of the household who brings out of his treasure what is new and what is old. Here ends the gospel for the day. Please be seated. The sermon today, which is usually based on the epistle or the gospel lesson, today will be based really on the Old Testament lesson. And contrary to usual, it will not be on a basic theme that is there for the Sunday, but it is on a very, very interesting history of the life of one of God's servants in the Old Testament, who was a tribute to God's greatness and wonder and brought Israel to a very, very special place among nations, but yet had one great fatal flaw. So I want you to concentrate today on this. I want you to go home with a new word if you don't know the meaning of it already. And the word is sometimes pronounced Hebrus or Hybris. And I looked in my American College Dictionary and I didn't find it in there. So it is probably not used a lot. But strangely enough, I have heard it on the news broadcast in the morning a number of times lately, very surprised to see it because it's so, uh, so seldom used. But it is, the word is hybris, and actually King Solomon is the poster child of hybris. Why is it important? Because it describes so many ways and so many times a soul has an idea to do right things and to do good things and plans to be an example of Christ or God in the world. And little by little, he begins to ignore things and become a little too self-indulgent and ends up in catastrophe. I'm going to read a couple definitions of the word hybris. One is thinking you're so wise and wanting greatness so badly that you sacrifice even what is nearest and dearest to you to achieve it. A second definition, pride and arrogance, an excess of ambition, pride, and ultimately causing 
the transgressors rule. Arborist is something that has been so evident in kings and rulers and dictators. But it has also been sometimes, unfortunately, a way to describe church officials or church people. But let us go back and get a little background on Solomon. And I'll have to say like they do sometimes on the news, what you hear might not be exactly what you want to hear. After all, we still regard Solomon as a hero of the Old Testament. Solomon had it one strike against him before he started to be involved in the political scene at all. He was one of many children of David. But he was a child of a very indiscreet affair that David had with Bathsheba. And it looked like he had three strikes against him, actually. But the first child that they are going to conceive, that she's going to conceive, dies. And the second one is received with great joy, that is Solomon, and projected to be the apple of David's eye. And in David's mind, because of the urging of Bathsheba, who was his, his preferred wife, he had promised her that he would succeed David when David died. So David comes near to the end of life and he is declared unable to rule anymore. And at the sound of that, his eldest son, who has a rightful uh, right to the throne by law, decides that he is now the king. Adonijah. And he goes out and takes a bunch of his friends and a bunch of the officials and he starts having a great party. And Nathan, David's conscience, and one that looks after his welfare, goes and tells Bathsheba that Adonijah has already declared himself the king. And he said, didn't David, your husband, promise that to you? And she said, yes, he did and I'm going to make sure he delivers. And see, she goes in in the last hours of David's life, and she said, you know, your son Adonijah is celebrating that he is now the king to succeed you, and you promised that to my son, to our son. And he said, I did. And so he says that he, he, he performs a ceremony in which Solomon is recognized in the public square as the new king. And Adonijah takes off. But then he comes back and says he is going to support Solomon's reign. But he asks a request for one of David's wives as a prize. And Solomon gets so upset that he has Adonijah assassinated. But now he comes to the point in our text from the Old Testament today where it is in a dream. This is not an actual event according to the uh, first book of Kings. It is a dream that David has, or uh, that Solomon has. But that was taken as proof that it was a real call from God anyway, but really doesn't matter. So in this dream, Solomon is asked by God, I'm going to give you anything that you want. So you just tell me what you want and it will be given to you. That's because I loved your father David. Yes, he had some indiscretions, but he repented faithfully for it and straightened out afterwards, even though his household fell apart. And what Solomon asked for, I guess would be a surprise to all of us. He said, give your servant therefore an understanding mind to govern your people, able to discern between the good and the evil, or who can govern this your great people. 
There is an absolute feeling of humility in Solomon at that point. And he has been trained by David and possibly Bathsheba, but also by elders in his tabernacle that he was trained to be subservient to God. And he was going to show that by a great humility as he ascended to the throne. And the Bible recounts that God is pleased with this and said, I am really pleased that my servant is so humble. And because you asked for discerning wisdom to rule the people rather than fame or riches or long life, I'm going to give to you that as well. So Solomon goes with God's blessing. With complete faith that he is going to do God's will and he is going to be a great king. And these, this seems to come to pass. He is involved as a great author, a poet, songwriter, and a great builder, and had immense wisdom. Now there is a little IQ test that comes in the third, uh, third chapter of 1 Kings, in which is supposed to show how wise that Solomon was. And it's a very famous epi episode, and it's recounted in all kinds of literature, both Christian and non-Christian. But there are two women that are claiming the same baby. Both of them have had children, but one of them has died. And both of them come and ask for a decision of whose baby is the legitimate child of one of the two women. And what Solomon does, he doesn't have the modern workings of modern court. But he said, after a while they'd been discussing this and both claiming to be the mother, the actual mother, he says, well, come and bring me a sword. And he said, what I'm going to do is cut this baby in half and then each one of you can have half the baby. That to me does not show ultimate wisdom, but nevertheless, that was thought to be a great decision in that day. And they, and of course, what happened is that the real mother didn't want the baby cut in half, and so she said, give it to the other woman because I don't want to see the baby die. And then Solomon says, well, this is the rightful mother because the rightful mother wouldn't want the child to die. Well, it seems like a reasonable choice at this point. I've heard it that many times. So Solomon is known throughout the kingdom as a man of wisdom. As a matter of fact, in other places in the Bible, he is said as the wisest man ever lived. How would you like that? The wisest man. And he forms all these alliances. And Kings is spent about six chapters on telling that Solomon was the one that built the temple to God that had been destroyed. David was supposed to have done it in his opinion, but God said, no, we'll wait for Solomon. And Solomon does this building. He builds another building for himself, which is very ornate. He is visited by one of the greatest women uh, politicians at that time, the Queen of Sheba. And she comes and gives him a little IQ test and then is just overcome by how wise this man is. And he keeps getting these alliances with other nations simply because of his wisdom. This is the thing that he asked for from God. God gave him and he utilized wisely. But there is a caveat in this little, little text that we had from the Old Testament this morning. There is a caveat in the promise that God made. And what he says two verses later after this text, he says, if you live by my commands, if you walk in the way of God, I will give you this plus long life, plus wealth. And one of the big warnings was you must not align yourselves in marriage 
with wives from pagan culture because they will lead you astray and you will not be faithful to the one true God. You will constantly be breaking the first commandment from the gifts I gave on Sinai to Moses. At this point, Solomon displays the humans that become the end for Israel. He says, I really don't have to listen to these commands anymore. I have been acclaimed the wisest man on earth. And obviously, I can make any decision that I want. And he saw, not only does he involve himself in a lot of marriages with women from the pagan countries, but one by one, he builds shrines to them. Not only has he done the shrine to the God that he was to worship from the beginning, and whose path he was to walk, but to every one of the pagan gods, as if it didn't make any difference. You're starting to see where this is going and how this is a replica of what we do on earth. All good intentions, but willing, once we think we know it all, that we can make a little deviation from what we said we were going to do. At that point, this wisest man in the world seems to deviate on everything that he does. First of all, he divides the country into 12 districts, this land of Israel. And what he says is that one month out of every 12, every one of the people from that district is going to be an enslaved labor to me, the king to help me with all my building projects, most of which are dedications to foreign gods. Because of what he was spending on these buildings, he increased the taxes. Not only that, but into the 12 tribes of Israel, he showed a great, great special appreciation for his own group, his most southern group, Jews. They didn't have to pay taxes. You can imagine how that went with the 11 other tribes. Not only do you not have to pay taxes, but all the money that comes from the other provinces will be divided with you. Then he sells 10 cities on the northern part of Israel, 10 cities, to one of the uh, other king. Can you imagine our president saying, I've sold Minneapolis, New York, and Chicago to Canada? That did not go well. Then, on top of everything else, he built a temple in Jerusalem, and the Ark of the Covenant, the thing that was the symbol of God's presence in the world, was taken away from the north and put in the temple in the south. And in the eyes of the people from the north, the 11 tribes, not only were they slighted and made slaves, not only were they made to make many taxes, not only did they have to share their tax money with one province that paid none, but God was taken out of their midst and they began to rebel. And so what Solomon does is he sends his chief of the military, Rehoboam, to the northern kingdom to get things straightened out. And Rehoboam is worshipped when he comes up there, and they ask him, will you be our king and lead us against Saul? And he thinks this is a pretty good idea, but Solomon hears wind of it, tries to kill him, and he runs to Egypt and remains there until Solomon dies. When Solomon dies, his son has probably been learning the ropes pretty much. And he goes to the northern kingdom and asks, or tells them that he's going to be their king now. 
And they're saying, now Rehoboam is our king. And they say, just get out of here. And they chase him out. And then the country is divided and it slides into a constant decline until it evaporates completely in the early sixth century and doesn't get restored again until during my lifetime, 1948. The picture is one of a man who has amazing capabilities, amazing things that he's been given by God to rule. He has gone, asked God for certain things that seem so high in priority and then wasted them because he became so wise that he was even wiser than God. We don't have to do point to a lot of examples, but I'm going to point to one. If I hate to talk about another clergy, but it's so common. And if you want to see somebody that is a poster child for Hebrews in the modern times, it would be Jim and Tammy Bates. They started out as young people interested in the ministry, committed themselves totally to God, studied the word well, became part of a huge empire of Christian broadcasting, had just an amazing show of spiritual wealth. And then Hebrews set in, and they didn't walk in the ways of God anymore. And it was more important to buy Rolls Royces or air-conditioned dog houses than it was to give the money to charity. They started out with complete faith, with complete knowledge of where they were supposed to go and where they wanted to go. But gee, it doesn't take much to get us offline. And so it's a warning. And actually, both the epistle and the gospel have warnings today to stay in God's path, to know the God's will. Because actually, in terms of wisdom, the beginning of wisdom is the fear of God. Actually, Hebrews can not only be the downfall of great, great leaders, like Alexander the Great, the Roman emperors, Napoleon, Hitler can be the case of a very, very, uh, in, very, very common individual who knows what to do, commits himself to Christ, has every indication that he's going to take that road, but somehow along the road, he begins to think to himself so wise and not care about anybody else's ideas or welfare and wants to work only for himself, whether it be in the community and politics or whether it be in a church. The picture of Solomon is kind of a depressing one today. A man who's so richly endowed with all possibilities actually leading to the end of the state of Israel for centuries. But it comes from thinking yourself too wise that you don't need to listen to God's word anymore. And little by little, you make compromises until the compromises become so great that they don't destroy something that's really important. Pray today that God deliver you from Hebrews. Amen. Sermon hymn. 742, what a friend we have in Jesus. 742.